Welcome to NGA Notable Lectures, a podcast offering a deeper understanding of all things artistic. For this multimedia creation, conceived for the National Gallery of Art on the occasion of the John Cage Centennial Festival, Washington, D.C., Roger Reynolds discusses the American poet John Cage as a composer, writer, philosopher, visual artist, and performer. Recorded on September 9, 2012, the presentation offers a personalized perspective on and around Cage and his work. Passages recorded from a 1985 conversation between Cage and Reynolds are included, as well as some of the signature one-minute indeterminacy stories as recorded by Cage. The live and recorded readings interpenetrate each other and coexist with projected images and videos. Guest pianist Jenny Lin performs Cage's Seasons, Excerpts, Quest, and One, which intermingle and overlap with other elements in the presentation. Encounters. In the spring of 1960, I attended an event on Manhattan's Lower West Side. The program included Lamont Young's poem for Chairs, Tables, and Benches. Office furniture was pushed around a tile floor, causing the intended metallic screeches, rattles, and scrapes. John Cage was a performer. After the program, I introduced myself. He was unexpectedly welcoming, invited me, in fact, to come with him for the weekend to Stony Point, the cooperative where he lived outside of New York City. The next morning, we got in his Volkswagen bus and headed out of the city. On the way, I asked him, citing a March 1960 Time magazine article entitled Anarchy with a Beat, and illustrated by a photograph of Merce Cunningham assaulting the strings of a piano with a dead fish, how it felt to be so grievously misunderstood by the press. He smiled and allowed that there were advantages to keeping the cork in the bottle. The strategic value of egregious misrepresentation and mysteriousness had not yet occurred to me then. In Stony Point, I was provided a futon. John worked throughout the day, as did I, at a floor-level table. He was quietly dedicated to the task at hand. His devotion to the principle of discipline was unmistakable. He did whatever it was that he was doing as well as he knew how, and was open, it seemed, to the companionship of others who did the same. Back in Ann Arbor, I promoted the idea of John coming to perform with the Cunningham Dance One Club. evening, when I was still living at Grand Street, and Monroe. Their visit was arranged and brought Isamu about two Noguchi revelations. Came to visit Arriving me. early at Ann Arbor High School Gymnasium for a rehearsal, I heard Tudor playing Debussy. Agents. There was nothing in the room. Music I knew from recordings by the incomparable no Walter Gieseking. David was no equally incomprehensible in different ways. The floor Some was of covered. Merce's music was on tape wall and included wall. sonically frail but nevertheless With electrifying recordings of Conlon Nancaro's studies for player piano. The windows One had no curtains. leads to several others. No drapes. Isamu Noguchi said, an old shoe would look beautiful in this room. Kwangtze points out chance and determinacy that a beautiful woman we were living in Paris, no money, no heat, little food, no contact. Who gives pleasure we heard that Carter and Zanakis were in Berlin on Ford Foundation grants. Two men bought a car for twenty-eight dollars and drove through East Germany to West Berlin. Takahashi and Jacobs were playing serves Carter's double only to frighten with Moderna conducting. It was that the fish. The next year, we were in Italy, and I decided to write a piece in response. When she jumps, quick are the mouths of earth. In the water, very impractical. No chance of performance. 
an ensemble with three cellos and three flutes, allowing the same sound to appear to move in space, also an oboe soloist. We were in residence at the Rockefeller Foundation Villa Cerbelloni, north of Milano, so when the score was finished, I sent a copy to New York so they would know I was not wasting their money. The score was placed on a table in the Foundation's waiting room. Conductor Arthur Weisberg came in seeking their support to fund his contemporary chamber ensemble. He decided to perform my piece. Next year, I was in New York, walking on Broadway and ran into Arthur. He said, this is incredible. We're editing the non-such recording of your piece right now. Come on up. So I came up. And of course it was a beautiful and accurate performance, but there was no spatial separation. I said, it's all compressed in a central knot and I can't hear the movement of motifs across the ensemble, the cellos and flutes. Arthur said, the engineer doesn't like the ping pong effect. But the score is very clear and the spatial interplay of motives is essential, I responded. They could not change it. Of course. It was against the recording engineer's personal ethic and he had control. An English critic and I decided to skip the other concerts that day and drive out to hear John's uh, rehearsal. And it was thrilling in every way, and at the end of it, the orchestra applauded for quite a long time. <laughs> there were only three listeners. <laughs> but the thing that struck me then was the uh, synchrony of behavior, which I had not thought previously was characteristic of your work. And I never ask you about synchrony. You mean the... the um the coincidence of those five orchestras? Uh, no. <laughs> See, there's no way you can trap John. <laughs> not, not that I'm trying to. <laughs> no, I, I, no, I mean synchrony, and I, but I mean within the group. That is to say, people within the groups do things together frequently. No, they do, yes. And I hadn't thought that that, that I was... Would do that. <laughs> There's nothing I don't think you would do, but I hadn't thought that it was characteristic at all. No, it, it, it isn't. Sharing. John Cage enjoyed cooking and said to me late in life that he was working on a cookbook. Regrettably, an unrealized intent. Some recipes were detailed, others were a matter of fact. Their restraint, bringing a smile to one's lips, squash, etc. Bake without cutting open at 425 degrees for one hour and 15 to 30 minutes. Some, like rutabaga, need more time, if very large, possibly two and a half to three hours. In December of 1964, I took a red eye from California to New York for a program presented by Lucas Foss's Creative Associates in residence at SUNY Buffalo. 
my interest had been aroused by the reappearance of a composer friend's name, Michael von Biel. He is also a visual artist. We had organized events in Cologne at Mary Bauermeister's loft in the 60s. Michael, along with David Tudor, the announcement alleged, would assault a prepared barbecue broiler with amplified electric drills, among other implements of violence. Their performance was suitably alarming. After the program, John and I were walking out onto 57th Street. He said, you look exhausted. Have you had anything to eat? I admitted not, and we took a cab to his place. He improvised a simple, fragrant, crunchy, mouth-wateringly nourishing meal in a few moments out of what was at hand. My introduction to his engagements with the world of macrobiotic dieting he had acquired from Michio Kushi in Boston. Some years later, John and Russ Cunningham were giving a dinner. Their 18th Street loft was, as one would have expected, unexpected. Entering, one found that the right-hand wall was a thicket of plants, tall forms, bamboo, lent a fresh and damp character to the air. Indoors, one nevertheless felt out of doors. John was cooking, Merce bustling about, seeing a large table opposite the forest, arranging the necessary dishes and commenting without sympathy about how long it was taking John to produce the promised meal. In the end, it was magnificent. I remember especially small golden nugget squash hollowed out and filled with home hummus, a drizzle of sesame oil and black sesame seeds on top. The components, and Merce and John, were complementary each in its way effective, not without both the differences and resonances of the choice to share their existence. We were speaking just before coming in here, uh, somehow, about cooking. <laughs> of course. Uh, R Roger Reynolds is a, is a very fine, probably a very fine cook, period. But, but uh, 
the cooking of yours that I enjoy is Chinese. I, I was saying that, uh, that I don't cook as much as I have because I became engaged with the computer. And the computer tends to sap you of time. It's a narcotic and it's in its own way. Uh, I've had your cooking only once, I think, and that was after a concert at the Carnegie Recital Hall in New York when Michael von Biel and David Tudor played a work of Michael's which was for a charcoal rotisserie. <laughs> it, it was an exceedingly powerful experience. And afterwards I was uh, somewhat shaken. And we were leaving the hall and John said, uh, are you well? And I said, well, I had to fly all night from California to get here and it's cheaper that way anyway. And he said, uh, perhaps you should come down and, and I have some food left. And it was a, a wonderful experience. It was not Chinese, but I think it was already into the direction of macrobiotics. Oh, really? I don't know if it was. Uh, when did you begin the macrobiotics? I'm such a poor historian. <laughs> I, I think it's 10 years that I've been um, following in my way the macrobiotic diet. I like it very much, and if anyone wants to have it recommended to them, I recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you move in that direction? Uh, I, I moved because of my health. I had, um, my wrists were swollen like that. And um, I couldn't lift a cup with one hand. I had to use two. And I had trouble walking. And after a I had been, at the doctor's suggestion, I had been taking um, 12 aspirin a day for 15 years. Oh. And uh, finally, I, when I changed the diet, all the pain disappeared after one week. And I've been so delighted that, that I've become a convert. The space of silence. Wesleyan University Press's announcement of the publication of Cage's book, Silence, was momentous. Young composers then were focused on changing the world. They had composure. But when I got my copy, I consumed it virtually without getting up from the table. Serendipitously, Cage was coming to Ann Arbor. It was December of 1961, and I arranged to interview him. When the transcript of our interview was published in C.F. Peter's A John Cage Catalog, he generously titled it Interview with Roger Reynolds. As Robert Ashley had a reliable microphone and tape recording set up, I asked to hold the interview in his living room. I prepared carefully. Cage began the session by asking if I had actually read the whole book. Assured so, he remarked, candidly it seemed, that he had not expected anyone would. A good start. In that moment, perhaps because of the book, he saw the value of being clear and was. Bob was present and asked whether he could insert a question. He said, it seems to me that the most radical redefinition of music would be one that defines music without reference to sound. John was unsettled. He asked a few clarifying questions and then did what any politician would, shift the subject to ground he felt more comfortable on. It was a precious moment, watching this master of invention, indirection, provocation, evasion, and inversion, unnerved by a younger generation, someone already building out from his provocations into a space that had not been anticipated. I proceed in, in two ways. Uh, I receive requests from outside for music. And, 
And um, then from time to time I have uh, ideas that I want to, of what I want to do. And so there's a meeting of those and some kind of uh, exchange takes place. When I, when my music was finally published around uh, 1960, and that catalogue was made that has our uh, interview in it. I uh, wanted to make a preface that, that would show the different kinds of music, because my music is more characterized by variety, I think, than by sameness. Mm. And I found that uh, some ideas that I'd had started at such and such a date and uh, and fell by the wayside after, at another point. And something that the, that the history of my attention has been to pay attention sometimes to just one thing, sometimes to several things at the same time. And uh, that some things remain interesting to me longer and some sure. Context or features. Walking in Helsinki's Hesperian Park with composer Yukka Tiansu, we were talking about compositional strategies. This has been a theme in our interaction over the years. At any moment, I ask him, how do you know what to do next? My interest was piqued by the uncommon inventiveness of his music, music that involves a continuous tumbling from one gestural, timbral, textural world into an unexpected new one. Is this pure invention or the result of a kaleidoscopically changing set of challenges thrown at his imagination by a shifting set of conditions or preordained demands? I assemble a custom world of resources and opportunities for each work. It's not like that for him. He generates materials without knowing either where they will fit in the final product or whether they will be used at all. I know when I am, say, half done. He does not know where he is in the overall process until he decides to stop. Perhaps this is in connection to his personal circumstance. He is a freelance composer 
who spends almost all of his professional time and energies on composition itself. This is not a privilege we all have, not a life that everyone would choose. Planning, devised conventionalities, landscapes of opportunities, repertoires of resource, these convert any thing can be next to which of the things that I have prepared will I use next. The importance of this distinction is fundamental for me. Yuka asks, which of these things remains most memorably after an experience? The entire path you have followed or a few striking moments during it? He argued, that we decide to listen to a musical work again as a result of particular moments that occurred during our first encounter with it. We want to experience these again. We wait for these moments. They are the lure. They are the reward for the investment of returning. In St. Petersburg, Karen Lindley and I saw Swan Lake at the Marinsky Theater. In scene two of act one, the bewitched swan enters stage left. The orchestra's concert master, he stood throughout the entire scene, spun out Tchaikovsky's enchanted melody, the combination of her lithe flexibility and his soaring line constituted a moment. There was no doubt about it. Earlier, we saw the Hivitresk estate near Helsinki. I remember most clearly the design elements that Elayel Saarinen had used, not the house itself or our passage through it. At the Hermitage in St. Petersburg, the crowds were suffocating. No air moves. Its impressionist treasures are the gifts to us all of the idiosyncratic eye of Maratsov and Chuchukin. After one, almost literally, fights one's way out onto the street, what remains? The sequence of rooms, the eras or cultures represented, the logias or the impact of Leonardo, Rembrandt, Kandinsky, Monet, Matisse, singular images? I imagine awakening in a hotel, dressing, stepping from my room, opening a door, across the hall and facing ever before seen image. It stays there. I stay there. No coercion. In fact, essentially, no context. No sequence. No proportion or timing of events no growth or subsidence to, nothing lesser, nothing greater. Moments and context. Can we do without either?
chagrin in 1980, UCSD's Department of Music appointed John Cage a Regents Professor for a two-week period. As I was departmental chair and had an administrative space, I offered John my office for the duration of his stay. He also asked if I could loan him a heavy cooking pot and then prepared a large batch of brown and wild rice festooned with various beans and sautéed mushrooms. He carried our Dutch oven with him through his La Jolla days, eating from it as necessary. The essentials were in place. Every morning, he arrived and disappeared immediately into his office. When someone knocked, he would open the door and converse, then return to work. One day, I was his visitor. He explained that he was making a text. It would be called Themes and Variations. He was using his mesostic writing strategy, as was frequently his practice, but in layered succession, so that the outcome of one procedure then became the subject of the next stage of manipulation. John was pleased with the outcome, positively gleeful. He showed me how the process worked, pointing out various felicities that could not have been anticipated. The delight he took in explaining and reading aloud was so infectious that I asked why he did not write an introduction, explaining how the processes worked and giving a few examples so that others could share in his joy of discovery. He smiled and said, that would not be possible. I took him to mean not appropriate and let it drop. Sometime after his UCSD visit, John sent a copy of the text he had been working on with this inscription. Dear Roger, this is what I finished while with you. As ever, John, Greetings to all the friends. I returned the thick sheath of papers to their mailing envelope and placed it to my bookshelf. Over the years, I lost track of it. Today is the 28th of November, 2003. I was looking through accumulated materials unearthed during a garage cleaning episode and noticed for the first time that what followed John's handwritten salutation, it was an unusually dense and explicit exposition over nine pages, was exactly what I had asked him for, a detailed and informative introduction to the genesis and methodologies of his themes and variations texts. For years, I have been recounting this anecdote, indicating Cage's unwillingness to reveal his processes and their delights. Only now, today, in 2003, do I understand what my presuppositions, or simply the busyness of life, prevented me from seeing in 1980. I lost the chance to thank him for his generous gesture. I was chagrined then and remain regretful now. Perhaps some amends can be made by indicating to you all now here today the process he detailed more than three decades ago. He introduced his text as one, quote, in an ongoing series, as an effort to find a way of writing which, though coming from ideas, is not about them, or is not about ideas but produces them. His initial subject matter comprised, quote, 110 ideas which I listed in the course of a cursory examination of my books. I suppose he meant silence, M, and so on. Here are some examples from his list. Non-intention, the acceptance of silence. Leading to nature. Renunciation of control. Let sounds be sounds. Anonymity or selflessness of work, i.e. not self-expression. Adventure, newness, necessary to creative action. America 
has a climate for experimentation. Process instead of project. Using these ideas as references, Cage then freely invented a set of mesostics. This poetic form entails a string of lines centered on a spine, wherein a column of capitalized letters forms, in this case, the name of one of 15 admired men. These central name axes read down the page and provide a principled basis for choice in relation to the evolving, new text. Once, when I was to give a talk... As one proceeds, one searches a source text for the necessary letter from at the spine, Columbia and then aligns the implicated phrase on the page so as to maintain college. its geometry around the capitalized spine. Cage used E. King operations. I ask to determine Joseph which ideas would be Campbell, the subject of each source mesostic, whether as I should well as say upon something. which name it would be built. Using the name of David Tudor, for example, Cage constructed the I following I forget poem. now what it was. We don't I was know what we'll have when we finish doing of what we're doing, but we know every detail of process we're involved in a way to leave no traces, he said, nothing in between herded ox. Where Perhaps he was considering here one should. of the ideas excerpted above, anonymity or selflessness of work, not self-expression. Instead of when treating I got the letter in their own right, from Jack Aaron, his Mesostic library as material for Renga, to again lecture the here form of at Japanese the teacher's poetry. college, I wrote back and said I'd be glad to, that all he had to do was let me know the date. The more well-known haiku form is short did. with seven, five, seven, rather five, I seven, then said five, seven, to David eight. Tudor, Renga is an extended form, five, the seven, five, is so seven, soon. seven syllables per line. That this I don't think at least I'll be able times. to get all 90 stories written. Cage noted that. In which <laughs> case, now and then, I'll just keep my trap shut. Traditionally, Renga he is said, written by a group of That'll be a relief. Finding themselves of an evening together and having nothing better to do. Successive lines are written by different poets. Each poet tries to make his line as distant in possible meanings from the preceding line as he can take it. There is no doubt an attempt to open the minds of the poets and listeners or readers to other relationships than those ordinarily perceived. Cage used his library of idea-inspired mesostics written on 15 different names, including David Tudor, to make a chance-determined Renga-like mix here, for example, is a theme, itself a mesostic on the name David Tudor. It uses as its material the invented mesostic cited above, along with four others also on the vowel-rich name of David Tudor. Here it is. We don't know at dawn and valley things to do, what we're doing. Zen becomes confusing South Sea Island. Mountain. Mountain breeze. Desert. Lake. To leave no traces, nothing in between, no need. The lines are grouped stanza-like, and each entity, whether single or multiple, is read in a single breath. These articulative, quote, divisions or liaisons were not chance determined, but were arrived at by improvisational means, Cage wrote. Although a set of sequential processes and the intervention of chance were used to generate the final text systems and variations, Cage's sensibility was engaged at every stage. 
Firstly, David Tudor was his most significant musical ally. His name itself surely aroused in Cage a rich palette of potential inferences and instances. The set of 110 ideas comes from his writings, already fully considered and suffused with intention. Writings that were directly culled, not by chance, but by act of will. The subjects were men who had, quote, been important to me in my life and work. Investment and resonance was assured. The generality of implication and philosophical bent of each called idea was such that there was ample space for him to find connections in the making of his source mesostics. We don't know what we'll have when we finish doing what we're doing, but we know every detail of process involved in. These lines speak directly of the relationship that Cage's compositions had to Tudor's discipline and rigorously detailed approach to performance. The fifth of the Tudor-based mesostics begins, we don't rehearse together, we gave that up long ago before we gave up smoking. A direct and personal reference to their entwined lives with a close of a smile. We can see immediately how distant, how Renga-like, if we consider his explanation, the thematic mesostic is in relation to its resource-driven predecessor. We don't know at dawn and valley things to do, what we're doing. Zen becomes confusing South Sea Island. We don't know at dawn is clear enough, but and valley shifts from temporal to geographic reference. Things to do seems to go back to not knowing now, not in regard to time or place, but rather actions. This implication is clarified after a pause for consideration. Now we understand the matter of doubt in mourning and within valleys to be about actions to be taken. Zen is invoked as a possible explanation or perspective for the preceding variability of meaning, but South Sea Island has, as the valley did earlier, a sharp turn effect, the mysteriousness of a koan. Now we again reside in a geographic space for a moment. The openness of these lines and their centered peacefulness does not feel separated from sensibility at all. Quite the reverse. Cage's strategies and methods provide opportunity and provocation, just as do the methods of any accomplished artist. They engage with, neither evade nor suppress, his aesthetic sensibility. Thank you. This has been a National Gallery of Art podcast.